Gold coins, jewels, and hidden treasures. People spend their lives searching for them, and some have sacrificed everything trying to gain it. For as long as humanity has existed, hidden treasure has been a hot topic, enticing imaginations and fueling dreams. The greatest expeditions ever sent out have been in search of precious metals and stones, and civilizations have risen and fallen on finding treasures and losing them. But what if I told you that the greatest treasures are not hidden in caves, underneath the sands, or beneath the seas? What if gold and precious stones were everywhere around you, just waiting to be revealed, changing not just your life, but those of everyone you know? Today, we're venturing to South Wales Rosilli Bay, a place known for its heart-stopping beauty, but also known for its stories of shipwrecked treasure, where gold still lurks underneath its shifting sands. And while there, I'm gonna to reveal to you treasure of a different sort, a treasure that once realized will change your world forever. Grab your shovel. We're in search of lost treasure on the journey. It's a place out of a dream. Breathtaking landscapes, incredible sunsets, tragic shipwrecks, and buried treasure. This is Rosilli Bay, home to epic coastline and enough myth and legend to make your head spin. Known as one of the most beautiful beaches in the world, Rosilli Bay is three miles of golden sands, flanked with 250 foot high cliffs, 633 foot high hills, smugglers caves and catacombs, and crystal blue waters as far as the eye can see. Listed as the UK's first area of outstanding beauty, words do not express the sheer majesty, scope, and size of Rosilli Bay. Rosilli is a crown jewel of Wales, and every year over 100,000 people visit this beach during the warmer months to bask in its beauty and isolation. Humanity has admired Rosilli Bay for thousands of years. Human remains over 33,000 years old have been discovered nearby, and these hills are dotted with stone circles, cairns, and burial chambers created before the pyramids of Egypt rose from the desert sands. Even the Celtic saint, Kenneth, the hermit of Wales, or Saint Kenneth as he's called today, made Rosilli his home after being miraculously saved by angels as a baby, rescued from the seas, and brought ashore at Rosilli's Worm's Head Island. And speaking of Worm's Head Island, it owes its name to Viking invaders, who in 850 CE began making raids into South Wales and believed the island to be an actual sleeping dragon. The Viking warlord Swain is believed to be buried atop Rosilli's hills. As legend has it, the fierce Viking warlord established his own kingdom here, wanting to possess Rosilli's beauty. And along the shoreline, Rosilli also features the most photographed house in Wales, the old rectory. The current house, built in 1850, is a cherished Welsh landmark, nestled in these majestic hills surrounding the beach. Originally used by the vicars who served nearby villages, over the old rectory's life, it's also served as a farm, a barracks for soldiers manning World War II radar stations, and is now a holiday cottage available for you and your guests. You better make your booking now, though, as the average wait time to book is three years. The Rosilli landscape is the definition of epic in every way. But for all its enchanting beauty, power, and glorious surf, Rosilli has a reputation for something else, shipwrecks and hidden treasure. Rosilli's best known shipwreck is the Helvetia, which ran aground during a horrific storm on Halloween night, 1887. Unable to be saved after the salvage ships sent to rescue her were lost as well, the Helvetia was left to rot in the sands for all time, as a reminder of Rosilli's cruelty towards seafaring vessels. But there's another shipwreck that treasure hunters at Rosilli crave, that of the legendary dollar ship and her rumored multi-million pound treasure still buried underneath these sands. 
Some say the dollar ship was a Spanish vessel that was trapped in Rosili's rapidly shifting sands in the 17th century. Others believe it was a lost vessel that carried the dowry of a Portuguese princess. And some believe it was a Spanish ship laden with gold from the Americas. While the exact source of the dollar ship has been lost to time, what is known is that the dollar ship did indeed carry a large amount of treasure. In 1807, Rossili underwent extreme low tides, which revealed a wrecked European galleon and loads of gold. Spanish coins dated between 1625 and 1639 were found all over the beach, lying everywhere upon the sands. On one day alone, as the tide moved even further out, over six kilograms of Spanish dollars, half dollars, and pieces of eight washed up on the shoreline. And when the stories of Spanish gold hit the papers, people flooded the gower, fueled with dreams of treasure. But Mother Nature did not stay in a giving mood. In a blink, the tide shifted, and no one could get far enough out to search underneath the waves, hiding the ship and its treasure once more beneath Rosili's waters. But this wouldn't be the dollar ship's last appearance. In 1833, another season of extreme low tides struck, revealing the ship's location again. And with that, another gold rush began, with seekers discovering gold coins, bullets, pewter, silver, cannons, even an astrolab in the sands. But just as soon as it reappeared, the tide shifted again, hiding the dollar ship's remains beneath the waves. The dollar ship's gold still lies in Rosili's shallow waters, waiting for the next extreme low tide. For while the wreckage of the ship may be lost to time, its gold still remains. But knowing the location of her treasure is only half the battle. Because it's not enough to know where to search for Rosili's gold, you have to know when to look. And speaking of when, if you're interested in the dollar ship's treasure, your next chance at discovering her gold coins may be on the 4th of March, 2023, or the 2nd of September, 2023. As over the next two years, it's estimated the tide lines will retreat to levels not seen for almost 200 years. But will the tide be far enough out and the weather suitable to reveal the hidden treasures of Rosili? That, I leave to you. Who doesn't love stories of lost treasure? I mean, even Jesus knew the power of such tales. Ever the master storyteller, Jesus used stories of seeking treasure to explain what the kingdom of God and the Father's love were like, where the characters involved took an active role in searching out items of worth, items that were lost, but then found, and often purchased with great price. In your journey, I'm sure you've come to realize that intimately knowing Jesus is a treasure in itself. The journey is an invitation to know the heart. You're invited into union where our God says, I delight in you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. And in reply, you have the honor to say, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. It's amazing what falling in love does, doesn't it? It's a complete reality shift. But here's something else. When you're in love and you read his scriptures, your eyes and your ears will sometimes reveal Jesus' words a bit differently than you may have been taught. Intimacy gives a deeper meaning to Jesus' sayings. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. When you know him, Everything changes, and even stories of gold and treasure take on a richer meaning. When Jesus used parables to speak of treasure in the search for hidden things, it was often mentioned as a metaphor for his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Most people are taught parables like this one are about discovering God's kingdom and giving up everything one has to possess it. And this isn't wrong. This is absolutely correct. When we search for his kingdom and find it, we want nothing more. But here's the thing. Most teachings stop there. Why? Because we aren't seeing and listening with wide open eyes and ears of love, and we don't understand who we are in His sight. Let's go a little deeper and get to the root of something nasty most of us believe. Most of us have a greater fear of judgment than we do an understanding of love. We're taught that our sins build a wall between us and Christ, and that through our striving, we can hopefully enter His kingdom when we die. Maybe, if we're lucky and we catch God on a day that he's in a good mood. And if God thinks that way about us, that means he thinks that way about everyone else too, which actually devalues all of creation. But does that sound like good news to you? That doesn't sound like the gospel that set the early church's world on fire, does it? The truth is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus didn't walk the world in the flesh to change God's mind about the world. God loves his creation. Jesus came to change the world's mind about God and reveal his glory and love through himself. And when we discover our treasured value in God's sight, all of a sudden, we can be sitting in prison in chains, but still enjoying the Lord's presence, knowing who we are in his heart. Jesus didn't die and rise again for trash. Jesus didn't come to release healing, hope, and love to create clay vases and worker bees. Jesus came and is coming for his bride, who he loves and adores. And that, my friend, is some real treasure. And in that treasure is purpose. When you grasp this intimate truth, you realize the deeper meaning of the parable. You realize that Jesus isn't only talking about the treasure as being a far off kingdom. You realize that to the bridegroom, it is his bride that is the treasure. God's children are his treasure, and it is he who offered everything to take possession of that treasure. You are the gold, but not only you, but everyone else in the world that he loves. We aren't just part of a kingdom we reach when we die. We are a part of the kingdom of heaven now. And when you know this, when you receive this, when it sits in your heart, all of a sudden you want everyone else to know their true value as well. You can't help it. Love himself compels you. You begin to see treasure all around you. But it's not just about finding treasure. It's about how we reveal it. You know, it doesn't take a person of God to point out the trash in someone or what they do wrong. The world does that every day. And it's super easy to make judgments based on someone's mistakes. And we all do it. Remember today's introduction? Those simple math formulas on the screen with the obvious mistake. Of course five plus five doesn't equal 13. And no doubt you gotta laugh at my expense or it may have driven you crazy with you wanting to correct my obviously incorrect answer. But when you saw my error, you couldn't help but focus on the one simple answer I got wrong and point to it. You may have made a judgment call on me. I've sloppy arithmetic, inattentive to detail, or I'm just plain old dumb. But what about the formulas that were correct? And what about the other formula behind me? The computations for creation, thus giving the reasoning for God. But no, you focused on what I got wrong instead of what I got right. You zeroed in on where you believed I fell short, and you might have even thought yourself superior because you caught such an easy error. And in so doing, you totally missed the next level stuff going on next to it. And while this was a simple arithmetic mistake intentionally made to make a point, it's a great example of what the religious mindset causes us to do. The religious spirit causes us to make judgments where we think people fall short and make mistakes and to elevate ourselves because of it. It causes us to devalue others based on their perceived errors and shortcomings. But here's the thing, short of Jesus, 
we never measure up, but that doesn't make us less valuable to Him, and it never diminishes your worth. And when we partner with Jesus to call out the treasure in others, it's not to point out where they're wrong, but to reveal the gold and purpose that Jesus put inside of them before time began. Yes, there's a time and a place for correction. Mistakes do need to be brought into the light. After all, as James says, we're to confess our sins to one another. But correction from a place of perceived superiority, when there's no real relationship, will always come across as an attack, no matter our intent. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of its errors, not me and not you. And we never get to judge someone because they sin differently than we do. Many modern believers are way too comfortable with using fear, shame, superiority, and anger as motivators to try to force or guilt someone into the kingdom of God. In essence, we try to use a negative force to establish a positive reaction, but that doesn't reveal treasure. It only plants bad seed, and rotten seed only produces rotten fruit. This is what Jesus meant when he said, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. But love never fails. And when we know the truth that he is the treasure and that we are the treasure, we are compelled to find the gold in others. All of a sudden, we're not seeing people through their mistakes, but through their worth. We're not bringing correction from a place of superiority, but of humility. We are called to be witnesses to Christ's glory through our love, not our judgment. This is how true radical change happens in people's lives. And this is how real salvation comes. And this is the kingdom of heaven breaking through into a person's life now. This is the discovery of the treasure of the kingdom. Do you mind if I tell you a personal story of finding treasure in the wildest place you can imagine? Years ago, I was in a Caribbean country on a short-term trip, in a country where witchcraft is a huge deal. And the village I spent most of my time in was in the shadow of a large mountain, and at the top lived a powerful family, Santerian priests that had reigned over the mountain for generations through their ancestral magic. For decades, visiting Christian missionaries made a practice of venturing up that mountain looking for a fight. They'd march their groups to the witch's property line and the Christians would rebuke them, call down God's fire, Jericho march around their land, try to cast devils out, you know, all the stuff. In return, the family of witches would hurl curses back, do rituals, cast spells, all their stuff. Anger, suspicion, and fear resulted all around. So when my host told me the stories and asked if I wanted to journey up the mountain to pray for the witches, I jumped at the chance. So I soon began to pray to Papa for breakthrough with this family, for them to know his love, for their hearts to be softened, and for them to respond. I asked the Lord for access to their hearts, you know, so they could be saved and know his glory. But then the bridegroom said something that utterly wrecked me. I heard Jesus explicitly say, Ken, I will not give you access to their hearts, not until you're willing to love them as I do. And I was shattered with realization. You see, my prayers, which I thought were good, reeked of manipulation. When I held my prayers up to the love of Jesus, I found that I was loving this family from an agenda, trying to save them. A noble thing, yes, but I was praying for them as if they were a target, something to be conquered. Basically, I was resorting to a form of witchcraft to try and prove the glory of the Lord and save the witches. And I had left true love out of it. The Lord reminded me of the parable of the woman and her lost coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He showed me that although the coin was lost, the coin still belonged to its owner, and the coin never lost its original value. And just like that, everything changed for me. I didn't have to go confront these witches to challenge them or rebuke them. I didn't need to call down fire. I needed to remember what spirit I was of, that of a Savior's love. You see, that family, they weren't a box to be checked. They weren't a variable in an evangelism growth chart, and they weren't a number in a quarterly report. In the Father's eyes, that family was a treasure. He already knew them. He already loved them. He already knew where they were in their hearts. I just had to show up and be His ambassador. When we finally met the priestess, we found that she looked like an ordinary lady, like someone you pass on the street every day. And after the introductions, I asked if I could give her a hug, and she obliged. And wrapping my arms around her, I felt the love of Jesus just surge out of every pore of my body, flooding into the door of her home, quieting the darkness and anger and fear. I felt like I was hugging a long lost friend and we had known each other forever. And tears burst from my eyes and when we finally broke our embrace, tears ran down her cheeks as well. I mean, it was one of the best hugs of my life and all I can say is that it was Jesus. The priestess enthusiastically invited us in and introduced me to her husband, the Babalawo of the mountain. And for the next five hours, we sat in the simple home of this family that everyone had been so terrified of, surrounded by tools of ritual magic, skulls, and animal bones. We drank tea while watching the sunset over the mountainside, talking about life and love and Jesus. When I looked at them, I didn't see a dark priest and priestess to be beaten in a spiritual battle. I didn't care about the rumors of curses. All I could see was the golden treasure that this family was in his eyes. I simply saw a family that God loved so much that he sent his only son. And that was years ago. And now, that family that everyone was so terrified of are radical lovers of Jesus. And they spread his love to any who will receive it. They find gold in the unlikeliest of places. They call out the truth of who people are in God's sight. They're local missionaries spreading the truth of God's love throughout the mountains of their ancestral home and are now even in charge of children's ministries in multiple churches. They go and pray for those who were once like them, the witches that the Christians tried to pick fights with. And through love, they're changing the face of a nation, finding lost coins wherever they go. Love, after all, it never fails. Your purpose is to be loved and to be a witness to Christ's glory through that love, to know you're a treasure and to reveal treasure in others because treasure hunters create treasure hunters. We are called to enter into relationship with one another, to love one another, to disciple others and bring them into this intimate dance with the one who loved us first. This is how true change happens in people's lives. That is salvation. And when you're in love, everyone knows. And those in love help show others how to fall in love. We don't draw people closer by telling them where they're wrong and by discrediting their closely held beliefs. It's not about supernatural showdowns and picking fights. It's about shining so bright with His love that His majesty cannot be denied, of shining so spectacularly that those who see it can't help but ask, how do I know the source of your love? That is how you become the light that everyone flocks to. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. It's about the love of Christ shining through you, disarming the powers and authorities through the love of the cross and resurrection. 
is about revealing the gold, gold that God put there for others to find. You're a treasure hunter, you see. It's what you do by being who you are, passionately loved by your Creator. I mean, look around. Gold's all around you. It's time to reveal it. And I'll see you down the road on the journey.